time. Yeah. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for uh, joining us today or tonight, probably. Uh, we are here in the monthly uh, journal club of the European Air Society and the last for the uh, 2022. And uh, to close the year, we have a very interesting uh, paper about both uh, implementing a new technique in a workflow in a hospital, in abdominal wall uh, 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 surgery, but also um, about uh, how, what tools can you use and the, the use of uh, quality management uh, tools um, that are very innovative and, uh, but very difficult to uh, implement. Uh, with us, we have first, uh, the General Secretary of the European Air Society, uh, uh, Mr. Andrew de Beau, and the Secretary of Social Media uh, of the European Air Society, Mr. Hakan Guk. And uh, we ha also mm -hmm. have one of the authors, or the, the, the main author, uh, or first author of the paper, uh, uh, Mr. Johannes Wegdam, and we will be discussing uh, his paper uh, tonight. Uh, if it, this is the first uh, uh, journal club that you're participating, we're following the following format. First, we present some uh, basic things about the paper, and then we have uh, a round of questions that we've prepared, uh, that we are discussing. And uh, in the end, we can ask uh, uh, questions that you uh, in the audience have set, would have asked uh, through the Q&A or through the chat. Um, and hopefully we will be done in an hour. So uh, good evening uh, to all. And I think we can begin with the uh, presentation of all the right. paper. I think I share the screen. Yes. <clears throat> um, OK. Uh, is it visible? Yes, spot on. Okay, thank you very much. Well, um, this was the title of the article and um, to be quite true, um, in the beginning, it, we find it very difficult to write another article about the TAR. The TAR is now a well-known uh, procedure. It has, uh, <clears throat> uh, of course, a myofascial uh, release uh, to decrease the midline tension and it all became popular after 2012 and we implemented it in our hospital in 2016. We know the technique, um, this is a, a diagram and um, we know where the mesh is and we favorize this technique because it, um, it seemed to have lower uh, surgical side occurrences and uh, less recurrences compared to other techniques. Anyway, the basic line of this speech of the underlying uh, foundation is First treat the patient, then treat the hernia. We were, of course, very eager to, you know, we have a new technique, there's a hernia, we're going to try it. But we, we, we find uh, we had some difficulties in the past with implementing the endoscopic component separation technique. And so we, we started to do it cautiously. And uh, not only we uh, did it cautiously, we also made a foundation that if you want to treat the hernia, first treat the patient, you have to have a good care pathway. And the care pathway was implemented in 2015 in our hospital, and we are a regional hospital in the Netherlands, and we implemented it um, with a program, and uh, we had a care pathway, and the care pathway is mainly based on three things. We have a carousel, uh, people come up from all over the Netherlands to Helmand to uh, have their complex abdomens um, uh, repaired. And so in one day they get a quality of life scores, the CT scan, the laboratory pulmonary function test and the biodex test uh, functionality. And then in the same month, we have a multidisciplinary team meeting, which is not only a hernia and a plastic surgeon, but especially you need to have the intensive care physician, the pulmonologist. We learned so much from the pulmonologist that's incredible. As a surgeon, what can you do? What can't you do? It's not just the COPD or the, the, the gold classification that, that divides the patients. 
and we have uh, the anesthesiologist. Um, and um, it, it's amazing. Uh, in the beginning, it's a lot of a hassle to have all these people together. But when the ball is rolling, this is the real big game changer to have an actual multidisciplinary team. And what do we do? We always follow this, the same protocol. First, we stratify the patients, which is very important. Um, and we come in the end, uh, you see the traffic light. We give all the patients the traffic light, green, orange, red. Green, nothing is necessary to uh, have them uh, operated. Uh, red, uh, they have no uh, modifiable factor and no any uh, option that we will ever operate them. And uh, even in an acute situation, we will not do it. And orange is the biggest group, is the people who need prehabilitation, is the people who um, the cardiac status is not confirmed yet. And um, so to go from the beginning, we do a stratification. We use the hernia patient wound classification. Divide. Uh, this is a real good classification devised by uh, Pietro Ledo-Novitsky in his book. And it classifies into four ordinal scales of the risk of getting having a wound complication recurrences. We also use the Fisher score to determine the pulmonology uh, 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 complication rate, and of course the EHS. Then we discuss the surgical options and all the difficulties we expect. Then we discuss the modifiable factors. And then we, on basic on that, we give the green, orange, red light. If a patient should prehabilitate, and we think it's possible to operate, it will be orange. And in the end, after we set the goals and you have to uh, reach those goals within half a year, you can become green. If you don't become green, you stay orange or you go, uh, you stay, uh, you become red, but then you go off the waiting list. And the final discussion is the digotomic decision. Do you, we need an ICU bed, which was very um, important, especially during the COVID times. So, and we all put the data we put, uh, in a, a large database, and that was also the foundation under this study. Of course, the primary outcome in every study discussing uh, hernia surgery is um, complications and mainly wound complications. We don't look too well in studies on systemic complications, but we want to turn around. We have shown in oncology and in cardiac surgery that textbook outcome is really an interesting outcome. So you want the people, what, what is actually happening um, when you compare studies on based on complications, you never know what you're comparing. You're comparing apples to oranges. So we decided, let's take the textbook outcome, an uneventful uh, clinical postoperative course after TAR. So uh, one week, maximum of, uh, hospitalization, no complications in the short term and long term, no readmittance and uh, no recurrence. So we started with the first 20 patients and um, you see in the columns, uh, column one, two, three, four, and we decided to, um, to evaluate after 20 patients what happened. And you see uh, the SSO, you see that 60% um, of the patients in the first episode had uh, a uh, <clears throat> minor SSO or a larger SSO, a surgical site, event, SSE, 45%, or systemic complications, which were quite a lot, 65%. So we had to change something. We, we, were, we, were, um, we were, were not so secure whether we were doing it right. There were no um, uh, large uh, instructors. We saw a lot of videos. We, do the, we did a few times on uh, corpses in, um, in the academic, but this was the, you know, the, 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 the unknown grounds. When you look at the, the blue um, uh, shaded areas, you see that the 60% in the first column of the SSO is declining to 45, 20, 33%. In the, to in the total column, you see 41%. And that is what you usually see in all the studies uh, presenting on the TARS. You only see the last column. And you don't know what is happening in between the um, the, 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 the while you're learning to uh, uh, to perform the TAR. So our primary outcome was textbook outcome. And you see in the first uh, column that we had two 
textbook outcomes of the 20, 10%. It almost uh, decided us to stop with the with the tar because we thought we can do it right. Then in the second it became thirty. Then in the third column fifty five, and then go on. And the final uh, sixty nine patients only one third had a textbook outcome. If we look at the first column, so after the first episode we started changing our policy. We included too much patients with a stoma, decreasing the W1 is decreasing the infected uh, surgical wounds. And um, so we, we, we decided let's do less of these um, infected wounds and more midline hernias. And we tried to decrease the SSOs by improving prehabilitation, which means we had to stick closer to our set goals. Don't say, okay, we, we're, our goal, a goal of BMI is below 30, and we still operate them on 32. No, we have to be stricter. Then we also uh, increased our slots at the uh, at, uh, uh, operation room. So we decided to do more in less time. And um, we started using um, Arista, the, 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 the multi uh, polysaccharide uh, to uh, increase <clears throat> or decrease the level of seromas and hematomas. After the second episode, we found that there was a little bit increasement in textbook outcome and other complications, but the systemic complications remained. And we thought, well, what we're going to do about that? And we read the literature and there was somebody saying you have to measure the pulmonary, pulmonary plateau pressure on the deep neuromuscular block. And we start doing that and we, 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 we try to find out what was the good pressure when we can close, what can we expect pulmonary complications? And uh, we actually started using the Arista then. What happened was a further decrease in wound complications, a little increase in, um, in um, overall increase of textbook outcome. And we didn't find that uh, measuring the pulmonary plateau pressure did change the operative strategy, which means that we would send them earlier to the ICU or we would uh, keep them for a longer time intubated or that we decided to bridge instead of the primary close. So we found it difficult to, 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 uh, to connect it to a, a, st a, a, a strategy change. And then um, that was the time the COVID started and we really needed to, to, to be more accurate on the post-operative ICU bed planning because if a bed was planned, ICU was full, then the patient would fall off the list so we, we needed to check better into our uh, ICU, um, uh, the way we refer to the ICU. And we changed the indication again to large. We didn't dare to do large flank hernias in the beginning. And we decided to do that uh, as well. And then after the fourth episode, we started implementing the, 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 the negative pressure wound therapy on the incisional wound, the close to suction. We started with the Botox, the PPP, and so on, and we're still continuing with improving and looking back. And this is actually the textbook outcome. You see that it takes eight patients to uh, finally get a patient without complications. And then when you go on and you, you follow the line, and this was actually quite interesting because I was hoping that the curve would flatten, that we would 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 find some way uh, that an, 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 an flattening on a higher level of sixty or seventy percent, but this uh, curve demonstrates that we're still learning, and then we had to reevaluate what means the learning curve of the tar. Everybody was writing uh, the, the, in Spain. Spain they study it, and and, and some other countries to open. TAR has a learning curve of five to 10 or 15, and you have to do it under supervision. But then we decided it is not the learning curve of the TAR. The, the trick you can learn, it's, it's in the beginning, it's difficult. And yes, you get some complications, but it is the institutional learning curve what is depicted here. And well, that is what I would uh, like to, to say. The, 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 you have to build a really good uh, uh, pathway and a really good uh, foundation under the complete system 
including a multidisciplinary team that stages and that discusses, that prehabilitates, and then try to optimize the patient in the best way. Well, that was, uh, I hope, was not too long. No, uh, thank you very much for this uh, excellent presentation. Uh, and I think it, uh, uh, the, the last point, we will discuss it on the, on the, the, the final, uh, uh, on the end, but I think that is the, one of the most important outcomes here that they, you're talking about the institutional learning curve. And uh, we have we are surgeons tend to think more in our own, uh, uh, but we forget uh, um, that it's not it's more than that. <clears throat> okay, um, could you stop sharing your screen, perhaps? Oh, excuse me. Uh, how do I do that? Um, So you can move your uh, mouse to the up and you're gonna see the uh, options. Full screen, no speaker. Uh, you move the mouse, mouse cursor to the up, to the, at the upper edge of the screen or you're gonna see a menu. Uh, okay. okay, yes. Thank you. Now, we can start with the questions. Uh, I will share my screen. Okay. So um, that's the 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 name of the of the journal of the paper in the Journal of Abdominal World Surgery, the Journal of uh, EHS. So please read it, submit your papers there and start with the first question that uh, the, the structure process that you were using, the uh, plan, do, study, act process. Uh, did you find it helpful to recognize uh, the problems and finding the solution? Um, did you like, did you use, did you recognize patterns there that perhaps you would have missed if you have used the general subject <clears throat> way of uh, uh, looking at things. Um, the, the, the PDCA process um, is a way of thinking um, in terms to, to I always um, summarize it like this. If you look at complications happening in uh, 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 on your ward or on, on a specific uh, operation, and you you try to make a thematic uh, analysis of it, you you get oh, there are too many factors in playing uh, playing a role. Uh, but in the end, you you might find a pattern uh, like uh, we had so many SSOs in the beginning. Um, so you, you, there are too many uh, causes for an SSO. And um, you think first about yourself, uh, am I not doing it well then about the team? And then of course you blame the patient. And when you try to, to get this process in planning, okay, we plan to, to deal with it after 20 patients and we look at the SSO. Uh, because we can also look at recurrence. We could also look at uh, operation time. We could look at um, uh, fluids uh, uh, implemented. So we, we try to make the, the find the, the biggest problem and then um, find a simple solution. And when we have a presentation, the last slide should always be, what is the point of improvement? What is the next point of improvement that we're going to discuss? And then... This last slide is the first slide of the next section of evaluation. So that is the pattern. And um, uh, so the PDCA helps you to structure and thinking and uh, finding a solution. Um, but do you recognize patterns that you subjectively would have missed otherwise? Um, I, th I think the realization that you don't have to look at, at, at the total, but looking in between is maybe the realization 
um, that that we we uh, we made. Um, I have to one sidestep. There is um, at one point we started applying uh, Arista. I don't know whether you know Arista. It is a kind of cellulose. You 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 wipe it out on the. It smells like sugar, and you wipe it out all over the the the, the big bowl uh, of the patient. And uh, it is a platform for hemostasis. Um, so what we performed is an uh, an, an analysis of uh, patients with and without uh, uh, MPH, uh, and we found there was no significant difference in preventing SSO. Uh, like uh, seroma or hematoma, so then you could decide to 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 uh, to stop with it uh, after sixty patients. But um, we, despite we didn't find a difference, um, we found an overall um, decrease of SSOs. So there are patterns playing a role. We all know the bundle of care. And it's very difficult to find what to put your finger on the right spot, especially when you don't have a high volume in the beginning. So do I recognize patterns that I uh, would have missed otherwise? Um, I, I find it difficult to say, but I'm, 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 the pattern is the solution. Okay. Um, so let's go with the next question. What I, th I think probably you answered already part of that questions. Uh, like, what uh, did you? How did you identify the problems and came to the solution? I think you kind of discussed this, or do you have something to add? Well, um, you have to sit. You have to have some formal meeting, and the, when you have a, a the, the monthly. Um, meeting with uh, your colleagues who uh, in the beginning don't want to come because it doesn't give them uh, raise money and it doesn't give them uh, it costs extra time and uh, the ICU doctor actually needs to be on the ICU but when they when they um, are together and 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 we manage to we don't start uh, the meeting until everybody's there and then you identify the solutions uh, of the problems because especially I learned the most from the pulmonologists in, in, in all kinds of ways, which is still a big problem. Um, uh, th that is where the solutions come. General meeting, sitting together and showing the results. Okay, thank you. Um... Yeah, also about the textbook outcome, that is quite a novel concept in here in your research. And uh, you already said that we can use it to compare uh, outcomes that are not really comparable before. Uh, so do you think that it can be used uh, for that way to standardize outcome measurement in hernia surgery? I, I'm I'm a very big believer, but uh, this is uh, a subjective uh, opinion. Um, the whole problem in our uh, our type of surgery is that we're still comparing apple to oranges and um we, we still stick to the modified uh, vhwg uh, classification which doesn't take the hernia size into account um so it, it starts with the stratification which which is is still not um as good as the tnm classification in oncology i believe the hub HPW is a very good classification, but it's not validated. And um, textbook outcome is what we really want in the end. And um, there's always the operative factor, which which makes it very difficult to to make a very good stratification um, of a, to, to 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 connect outcome on stratification. But I think it's a positive factor. It's um, a simple factor and it is what we all want what i did not include in our study was the quality of life and i think you have to have a raise in quality of life at least in the end we are quality of life surgeons and um well i do hope uh, it it it's it, uh, people will um take it over uh, this this concept 
um, it, it is uh, used in many other uh, uh, oncological uh, um, uh, studies, but um, yeah, we, we, you know, our concept of thinking in morbidity and, um, and mortality is something so deep to, uh, in our brain that it's difficult to, to make it otherwise. Yeah, uh, we went uh, kind of directing the next question because that was it. How do you you mention the quality of life uh, uh, measurements and you, yeah. do you will you play will you add it to the to the equation? You're you're not operated unless uh, if you have not filled in our uh, quality of life uh, uh, questions. Okay, that's very clear. <laughs> that's a yes. That's our, uh, that's no. actually our only only reason for existence as hernia surgeons there's no other reason why we should uh where we can validate or where we can have the basis for our our surgery quality of life yeah, yeah. totally agree uh not not everybody in the hernia of the surgery world uh agrees uh, uh yet but i think uh also ehs is doing a lot of work uh, uh towards this um, conclusion. And do you think the learning curve will ever flatten? Uh, uh, or with every cycle, when you're broadening the indication or you bring more concepts, more problems will arise that will keep the, 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 the curve always rising? Yeah. If you put in, 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 in very worse patients, you will, you will always... Um... No, I don't think it will ever flatten, but I wish it would. <laughs> and um, I, we don't uh, have the availability of a robot. Um, and um, maybe that's something uh, what what may flatten it, but um, it, it helps you, your institutional uh, memory, create to create institutional memory. What are we doing? So, um, if I can just come in at this point, obviously, mathematically, the curve has to do something. It can't keep on going up and up and up because once you get a hundred percent of patients um, with a textbook outcome, you can't get any better than a hundred percent unless you introduce another assessment tool which you have failed to reach a hundred percent. But that curve can start to fall, in other words fall because when that curve falls that means i think you're having a worse outcome and therefore when you want to introduce either a different patient group or whatever you probably do need to look at this and if that introduction and the numbers start to fall you have to decide well is that an acceptable fall because quality of life you're helping overall but there's obviously a sacrifice, which might be readmissions. It might be more ICU care. It might be more wound infections. But overall, quality of life is improved in these people, even though they have a non-textbook outcome. But I don't want to detract from this work because this is really phenomenal work. This is what surgeons should do, but often don't do. So many of us have introduced new things and have measured nothing apart from the number we've done, and that's our ticket to travel the world and tell people about our great results, which we don't actually know about because we've not measured them. So this is a phenomenal amount of hard work with very innovative forward thinking. And um, I'm inspired by this talk so far. So I'll hand you back to uh, Alexis. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Um, and obviously you mentioned you were, as, as a unit, you were very experienced with the anterior component separation or uh, Ramirez, as I was known, um, and you started then using the TAR. And in uh, the end, you said you had uh, like a small percentage, but in the end you have uh, almost 100%. And uh, what, how do you compare uh, those, uh, uh, those two uh, techniques in your experience? Um, well, uh, first, I have to compliment you. You read the article very good, or at, at least uh, you looked very into detail. Um, 
there's one point I said, performing a Ramirez is criminal. And um, it, it is uh, always nice to have some, some, some uh, d d debut uh, debatable uh, statements. But um, when we started uh, in, in 2013, 14, we only did Ramirez and um, then the endoscopic cam and then the, the, um, the tar cam. What we found is we looked at our indication. And if you know the linea semilunaris, and if you have a hernia within both linea semilunaris, but you have to have to be at least two centimeters away from the linea semilunaris to, on the medial side, then the endoscopic component separation is better than the uh, open component separation. But any other hernia which is approaching the linea similaris or crossing the similar linea similaris due to stoma or any uh, flank hernia or the, the near the coastal margin, we we prefer the tar. But um, after so many tars and after reaching hundred percent and finding. Uh, a few patients in which you can close the, the, the posterior uh, fascia, but are not able to close the anterior fascia because the tar doesn't allow you to, especially in the upper midline. I sometimes feel maybe we should try the Ramirez again, but I'm very, um, the, the, I'm, I didn't dare to do it right now because there are so many complications reported. I wrote a, a, in Hernia a, a systematic review about the, the TAR and the, 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 the SSO were so incredibly positive comparing to the Ramirez that, and so when I compare both the anterior and posterior, the posterior has a, my, is my absolute favorite. And that's why it's favorized, popularized all around the world, uh, I guess. May I, may I make a comment about the paper that, uh, what I understood from the paper that you haven't uh, uh, kept the uh, hernia sac in the initial, you excise it and you go with the tar. So, if you keep the uh, hernia sac at the end of the uh, repair, you can, you know, if you do bridging at the upcoming questions, we are also asking the, uh, you know, the primary facial closure rate. So uh, you can uh, do a peritoneal flap, hernioplasty, cover the mesh with a thick uh, hernia sac. And, and also the, the question about you know anterior remoras is is only applicable for the midline hindus, not the laterals, as you know. So it's probably it's, it still has a place. Uh, the remoras is not the best surgery, I guess. No, it's a it's a wonderful technique. Yeah. Um, uh, I think it was a real game changer in '96 uh, then, but. Um, yeah, but the end of the big one. Yeah, yeah. and 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 I, I don't understand actually uh, what you mean by keeping the hernia sac. I know the 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 the, the Scandinavian Montgomery, and uh, they performed the sandwich, and we tried it. And um, in the end of the operation, before putting in the mesh, the hernia sac on both sides was always blue, and I thought this is this is going to be a bio burden. This is this is and, and I, you have to decrease your amount of bio burden, excise all the old meshes or uh, all the scar tissue, and including the hernia sac. And um, uh, well, I didn't perform a, 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 a prospective randomized control trial to with or without hernia sac, but I I don't see how you need the hernia sac when you perform a tar. Maybe in the in the, the, no. You you just don't need it. you close the back uh, um, the the posterior fascia and you don't need the hernia. Yeah, yeah. In for example, uh, in your uh, presented cases that I have seen some mesh, uh, you have uh, used some uh, by uh, composite meshes to uh, close the posterior sheet defect. Yeah. It, if you could uh, have preserved the hernia sac in, in the posterior layer. 
probably you wouldn't have needed such kind of uh, bilayer mesh, uh, that kind of defect, because it, it provides the enough uh, shield at the posterior layer as well as the anterior layer. Yeah, as the, you know, the uh, defense yeah. is actually should be uh, Andrew DeVoe here, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> Andrew. Um, it's down to philosophy. You either believe in it or you don't. Yeah. Now, you know, whether they go blue or, or not, I don't know. Most of the hernial sacs are pretty much collagen tissue, so they don't have a great blood supply. It's exactly the same as saying the anti-erector sheath goes blue. Well, it doesn't because it's it's always uh, it's always white. And you can't argue with, with I suspect, our published results or um, uh, Agneta Montgomery's published results where their standard rectus recurrence is, you know, 10% recurrence and their modified peritoneal flap is one and a half percent. So it does work. So it's a philosophy thing. I wouldn't get too bogged down um in the philosophy, because that's the fun part of uh, hernia surgery. But you know, we do have um, we do have some concerns that most people launch into a TAR program with very little audit or careful analysis of what they are doing and where they're going wrong, and that's why we see a lot of problems related to uh, TAR because. Um, People A are not learning it properly or learning it from YouTube doing it. And we see, I guess, because of its relatively uh, a new procedure to many parts of Europe, we're seeing a lot of surgeons in their self-taught learning curve. So that's the danger when people don't do an analysis like we see here. And that's why this sort of approach is to be commended. You need to know your data. And this is such a cool study because a lot of work went on. It is a little bit muddled, obviously, because this wasn't a retrospective review looking at at quartiles. This was you did 20 from from what, my understanding of what you said. You did 20. You thought, well, these aren't going too well because only two were textbook and you made some changes. So it's kind of difficult to unravel what was going on um, Elsewhere in the hospital, in other words, the non-TAR operations, I presume their results were also getting better. You were seeing more um, textbook outcomes in the non-TAR patients. Um, we looked at that. And um, we, uh, uh, we, saw, we see better outcome just by, uh, but then we, we uh, had the third surgeon and we, we trained her and, and then we had the, 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 you have a small dip and then it goes up. And, but we believed at one point that the, the, the number of tasks we performed per month was um, critical. Um, so we find that in the beginning we were doing uh, like two or three tars a month and then COVID came and it was uh, a half tar a month and then um, we, we needed to increase. It, it's, it's um, I think what I'm trying to write down is something you cannot write down and you can just say being focused, building an institute that is focused on hernia surgery will improve your results. And uh, there are only, even I, I looked into the literature, how many studies are there on the multidisciplinary team approach? Or how many studies are there that describe the, the, their pathway in which they address all these items? And actually there are, there's only one review from Colias and there are a few uh, from England, from York, the York pathway, and um, from uh, Moorhead, uh, who in London uh, uh, described it. So it is, it is a, a, a complex system science. And um, it's, um, but, but being aware what you do is, I think, the most important thing. Um, exactly. I don't know if you ever have read the study of Ramshaw. He's an American uh, uh, university, uh, Nebraska somewhere, and he has a small um, uh, hernia unit, but they're doing 
I'm I'm actually copying what they are doing, what he was writing about, and he just produced an, such a nice article about the, the 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 system science and and the real data, and he struggled with exactly the same things I was struggling to to you know you you start with you study every patient has two hundred points you put in a database from from the the, the length to the uh, length of stay to the the, 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 the the complications and everything. And he just couldn't figure out what were the real things that made their system work. And he found out that those meetings sitting together and discussing the patients and the outcome was the real um, innovation. And, uh, and, and if I may, he, he really made a very, very funny statement or nice statement. He said, when you have this complex science, we, and we're trying to look at linear model and the, the, the patient, the human is not a linear model. It's a complex model. It's a, it's a model of all kinds of inputs and, 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 and digits. So you, he started looking at it as a more complex science. He started to looking at, we have to discuss it and find what is better. And then during one of those meetings of a lot of these meetings, there was a case manager and a case manager is a nurse who, who helps these patients throughout the, the, the care pathway. And he said, one this case manager found out she could predict who would be a problem, which patient would be a problem, which patient wouldn't be a problem. And they were all discussing, you know, uh, risk stratifying and all doing all these things. And they were trying to find out what, what, when do you know when a patient will have a problem? Is it uh, the complexity of the, the patient, the comorbidities? Is it the complexity of the hernia? She said, no, it's something else. And uh, she couldn't describe it well. And they had a psychologist talking to her. And then they, they came with a new term, which was called emotional complexity of the patient. Emotional complexity was low, moderate, or high. And they put that on their data just 50 patients and then look at, um, and besides the hernia size and the presence of loss of domain, a high emotional complexity, a patient, you know, who, 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 who expect, has high expectations of the operation and, and, and a patient who has, you know, annoys you with questions or with, with, with. <clears throat> that were the patients who had the, were the most uh, related to their outcome of uh, those those argue, um, uh, factors. So it's interesting. I believe you have to have a multidisciplinary team and a good care pathway. Thank you. I, I just note uh, uh, take the a note for my next uh, uh, search, uh, <laughs> literature search about. Uh, these uh, publications because that is very interesting. Uh, so we go on with the questions. So you uh, placed some uh, uh, long-term bioreservable mesh in uh, CDC class three and four uh, ones, and compared to the monofilament uh, uh, polypropylene meshes, do you have observed any advantage in your cases there? And uh, what's your experience in using those in uh, CDC4 uh, wounds? Um, yeah, this is a long and, and broad discussion. Uh, we were part of the, 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 the European study on the phasics mesh. So we were a little bit less reluctant to, to, to play such a mess. But um, my my um and we know the long-term data of the phasics mesh in the european uh, patients in 80 patients and they're not super uh, uh high um but the recurrence is about 50 percent which is still high in high risk uh, and the contaminated cases but what um we don't have enough evidence on mesh users in cdc4 wounds I, I don't believe in biological meshes anymore. They will get a recurrence. Um, so this is the best other option. And we we found that even with fecal spillage, you can come a whole end. And um, if, if you're 
using a mesh in a, in a real CDC form mesh, um, if you use a, a bio uh, synthetic mesh in a real contam uh, con contaminated case, I have good experience with it. I mean, they will get a recurrence uh, probably, but it's where we're in a situation of patient saving, not hernia saving. And um, if you uh, have less contaminated cases, I always got horrified when my my former teachers were putting in a PPP mesh in a contaminated wound. And they say, well, it will come right. And we know the data that that, that you don't want to have an infected mesh, but the, the, the monofilament polypropylene mesh has some mercy. And uh, so we have to look at costs, uh, value-based healthcare. We don't know the exact place. If there's we use the the the, the bio uh, resorbable mesh um, due to its price only if there's real contamination, and um, I don't mean high risk patient uh, uh, with a high BMI or or, or 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 use of immunosuppressants that you should use it. You can use a polypropylene mesh, but. Any doubt of real big problems of a high SSO rate, then you we use a bioresorbable mesh and we have good experiences. Okay. Thank you. Then uh, question eight, what was your primary fascial closure rate? Yeah, and then I have to look into my uh, uh, results again because I, I remembered I- uh, I haven't seen in the paper. Oh, uh, well, it, it, it must, um, the, if you accept that when you do not close the anterior fascia, but you do close the posterior fascia, that that is a primary fascial closure, mm -hmm. I still don't know if that's the definition, then we have up to 100%. But if you um, don't accept the uh, anterior fascia when it's not closed, that you have a primary fascial closure rate, then it's about ninety five percent. So it doesn't it doesn't change. Um, there's no big difference in that. And okay, you were doing primary uh, only open tars. Yeah. Uh, do you think of uh, doing uh, minimal invasive? And what is your opinion on that? Uh. I've seen so many robotic videos using the tar on hernias. I would think that in an open situation, they wouldn't need a tar. Um, and you could uh, um, accept with a retromuscular mesh. Yeah, what is my, um, I don't have a robot. Uh, so I don't, I, I think it's wonderful, but it, um, it is very expensive. Uh, the, the, there is some um, some evidence coming that it might decrease even your your rate of uh, SSO. But my opinion is that when you do a an, 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 uh, how do you call it the hybrid tar? Yeah, I, I think you're making the operation so much more expensive for um, the benefit of the, the the ergonomics of the surgeon. I don't know. It's um, you, you whole, everybody in America is performing a minimal invasive tar, and um, I, I'm not trained it. I'm, I'm, I, I'm, but it's something you really need to be trained and trained on. Don't try it on uh, on three YouTube videos and uh, one Congress. So you haven't uh, uh, tried to do the laparoscopically as well. Um, well, actually, I have done a few. It's killing but, the, um, the shoulders. <laughs> but I, um, this is also something, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, we believed in laparoscopic surgery. I performed everything, the biggest hernias laparoscopically. But now um, I don't think we, we, of all the hernias, also the non complex cases, um, Maybe I'm I'm getting uh, uh, deranged in my head, but it 
we see so many cases of laparoscopic surgery um, when they have a, a, a recurrence on the on, on the cranial of, or cartilage of the of the previous placed mesh, even of my meshes I placed, that um, we have to first treat the patient, and in a lot of ways I think an open um, approach with a retromuscular mesh especially patients who are prone for hernia formation is maybe better than the minimal invasive laparoscopic surgery. But uh, that will be the subject of my next thesis. <laughs> <laughs> so we have, uh, before take home message, we have two uh, questions from the audience. Dr. Kiskin, he is asking two questions. Uh, one is uh, his thanks. Uh, he says thanks for the study and nice presentation. In which extent, extent and conditions should that technique be teached to surgery residents? The top technique for the residents, you know. Well, your opinion. In, in my opinion, you you start with uh, the, the, the the videos and um, you um, so. You start with the, the videos, then, and and of course, uh, you read the manuscripts about uh, the, the the theory. Uh, the second thing is you should do it on a on on a corpse. You, you it, it if you even if you could do it one morning, just practicing on a, on a, a deceased person, it's it gives so much. Um, uh, information. And the third is you should do it under supervision. And how many? I, um, we're not a teaching hospital. There are good uh, fellows. There are the slow fellow, slow adapters. Um, even I, after after so many tars, I still find it sometimes difficult to do the the the, the down up uh, approach in, in instead of the the top down approach. Um, I tried the, the Spanish approach. And uh, what is the the, the good a, a good teacher? Um, I think after 10, maybe you can do it. That's what the literature says, if you put mm -hmm. uh, a proctored. But again, it's the trick is very important, but it's not the trick alone. Yeah. The second question is that in your article, the systemic complications were higher than the wound complications. After your experience, what additional things should be offered to lower lower the uh, more the system complications? Uh, the funny uh, thing is that it, when yeah. I I wrote the article, I I looked into the large publications uh, and looked at the systemic complications, and um, less than one third describe actually systemic complications. So it's uh, probably uh, not as uh, a, a big thing uh, as was in our study. And um, I'm, I'm, I, I think uh, when you don't look at it, you don't see it, or maybe we are worse than the rest of the world. So um, we, uh, what we uh, because we had so many systemic complications, because we have a very strict registration system, in which um, if you get a, an, an aggressive tube, you already have an ileus. If you get a, a, a fever with coughing, you have a, a pneumonia. So we, we, we have a low level of registration. And um, what we should do is what you need to do in the prehabilitation process. Really look at the modifiable factors and try to uh, you know, pulmonary training with the inspirator, or try to uh, decrease weight. Uh, discuss with the with the 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 the, uh, the, uh, the internal doctor for uh, the bowel tract. I forget the name um, about stopping uh, the immunosuppressants for Crohn and stuff like that. You really um, you really should. Treat, and that's my take home measures. First, treat the patient and then treat the hernia and discuss in a multidisciplinary team what your, uh, the goal of the operation is to improve the quality of life. And that should be the only goal and should be 
is a very delicate and, and, and tough decision to take for us as practitioners. I think that's very true. And I think a lot of us, we see a hernia and then we see a solution to fix it. Yes. We don't put it into the whole process. One of our colleagues on the EHS board did a lot of work with um, quite aggressive prehabilitation um, and found that two thirds of patients no longer wanted an operation. So they wanted an operation to fix their back pain or they wanted an operation to fix their breathlessness. But actually after a period of prehabilitation and exercise and, and learning how to exercise with their hernia, their back pain had gone, their um, pain had gone and they didn't want an operation at this point. So we have a lot to learn in terms of preparing the patient. One of the difficulties with a study like this is the influence or changing what we do to improve results, but that may not improve the overall quality of life for the patient. And I, and I addressed that already, but you mentioned, for example, that early on you had a lot of patients with stomas, so they didn't do so well, so you stopped doing the patients with stomas. Now, that may be improving the results, but what about the poor patients with stomas and hernias that are not getting their operation? Maybe I picked that up wrong, but maybe a few words about that. Uh, well, you're right about the last uh, part. Um, um, we, we are finding the, the, the right indication. What is the good patient? And if you get so many complications with infected uh, um, uh, surgical wound fields, well, then you have to, to do something. And maybe now we're, it doesn't matter anymore. But it uh, whether you have a stoma or not. But in the beginning, you're trying to find the 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 the, the right way to 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 manage your boat uh, on the, at the sea, which was quite windy. And your first part, I'm I'm astonished what you just said, because that's what we find as well. That is that when you really treat the patient well and prehabilitate, we 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 patients tend to to um, to have a better life with their hernia and um, that's one part of the shared decision making process that uh, is the ultimate goal of the surgeon is to minimize surgical trauma well when you really prehabilitate you really uh, diminish surgical trauma and um, it's it's interesting um, there's another thing what is interesting um, I was looking at what, how many patients a year, how many patients are complex? How many patients, according to the Dutch guideline for midline incision, are complex hernia patients? And I found that there was, uh, so we have in the Netherlands 17 million inhabitants. We have about five, 6,000 incisional hernia operations. Of course, there are primary uh, inguinal hernia, which are complex, but Let's say this this five thousand. How many of them complex? And I tried to figure out the data, and I thought, well, maybe a thousand. Well, we perform a thousand Whipples a year in Netherlands. We have eight professors and eight uh, university hospitals, so we might, and we still uh, do not have a real uh, genome um, hernia professor. So there is some place we we have a reason to be a hernia surgeon. But then I looked in the data in, in, in America and they were, you know, the, the, the first decade, it was rising incredibly. They call it a hernia, incisional hernia epidemic. But now I see in the last reports that it's going down. So it's the, the, in, the incidence, of in, uh, incidence of incisional hernias is tr uh, stabilizing, but the rate of people that are actually operated is really decreasing. So maybe it's an effect of the minimal invasive surgery, or maybe it's an effect of increased prehabilitation. I don't know what is happening, but there are still place for us. But it is uh, interesting that you mention that people of patients tend to do not want to be operated anymore. We have to think about it. Yes. That's probably a useful place to stop, uh, Alexis. So prehabilitation is important, working up your patients, knowing the reasons for operating. And if you are going to operate, make sure you're doing it right in an institution that has an interest surrounded by people with an interest 
uh, and a complex, although we haven't strictly defined what a complex hernia is, is not for uh, for every, every everyone just have a go at because the outcomes uh, will not be as good as if uh, when when there's a focus around it. So thanks everyone for joining. Uh, thanks Alexis for organising it. Hakan is ever driving this. And Vianis, thank you for a fantastic paper. And uh, I do hope uh, more people will read it and will continue to promote it. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please remember to join the 